Hi guys, welcome back to Presume Legal. I am Misha Janice. I'm an attorney licensed in both New York and Florida. Tomorrow morning, there is going to be a hearing in the Donald Edelson case up in Leon County, uh, Tallahassee, Florida. The hearing is going to be a uh, motion in limine, Donna's motion in limine, directed to the testimony of uh, Sergeant Christopher Corbett and the related summary exhibit that the state has presented uh, will be introduced into evidence. So in, I am planning on streaming that hearing in the morning. So as a prequel to it, I wanted to go over the motion because I haven't actually read it through in its entirety. And I figured I'll bring you guys along. So let's look at the motion and let's look at some of the accompanying information, I'll say, um, that can help us understand the motion a little better. And uh, let's see what we have in store for us tomorrow. All right. So I am sharing my screen here. And here we have the motion. Defendant Donna Adelson, by and through her counsel, respect, respectfully files this motion in limine directed to the testimony of Sergeant Christopher Corbett and related summary exhibit and states as follows. The state of Florida has indicated an intention to call Tallahassee Police Department Sergeant Christopher Corbett to testify in this matter. Per Sergeant Corbett and the state, the substance of his testimony will be to present a PowerPoint slide deck, currently 329 pages, entitled blah, 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 communications record analysis. The state has characterized this slide deck as a Florida statute 90.956 summary exhibit. Additionally, the state has sought to designate Sergeant Corbett as an expert witness in communications record analysis. But as this motion will demonstrate, Sergeant Corbett's PowerPoint and testimony do not constitute expert testimony, entitling Sergeant Corbett to designation as an expert witness. Footnote one, to be clear, this motion is not arguing that Sergeant Corbett cannot testify at trial, but rather is limited to the objection to him being an expert witness at trial because his testimony does not qualify as expert testimony. Three, moreover, the state's proposed 329 page summary goes far beyond the limits of a proper summary exhibit under Florida statute 90.956 and should therefore not be admitted to the jury. In fact, as Sergeant Corbett's deposition testimony reveals, the PowerPoint is a skewed presentation whose contents were not selected by Sergeant Corbett on the basis of any specialized or te technical knowledge or in an effort to fairly summarize the contents of voluminous records. Rather, the slide deck's contents were selected by the state attorney's office based upon strategic considerations in an effort to advance its theory of the case. Such a slide deck may be appropriate for a closing argument, but it is not appropriate for treatment as a summary exhibit under Florida Statute 90.956 that will be presented during the state's case in chief, admitted as an exhibit, and go back to the jury room for consultation during deliberations. This motion in limine is presented in three parts. First, it will discuss the PowerPoint slide deck as it currently stands and what Sergeant Corbett testified about in his deposition, which took place on August 22nd, 2024, three days after receiving the draft exhibit. This section will demonstrate that the slide deck is more in the nature of an argumentative summation prepared by the state attorney's office rather than a technical analysis or summary prepared by Sergeant Corbett. Second, this motion demonstrates that Sergeant Corbett should not be admitted as an expert under Florida Statute 90.702. And third, this motion shows that the state's PowerPoint slide deck should not be admitted to the jury as a summary exhibit under Florida Statute 90.956. I would say that's a summary of their motion. They really have a problem with the slide deck um, that they are saying the state created, the state instead of Corbett created this slide deck, which is 329 pages. Now we know that the information the slide, the slide deck represents is the thousands and thousands of pages of voluminous data. Let's go really quickly to a couple definitions because they mention a couple Florida statutes. And I just want you guys to see exactly what they're referring to. 
So this is the first section that I want to look at. 90.702 of the Florida statutes. This is talking about testimony by experts. And it says, if scientific, technical, or other specialized knowledge will assist the trier of fact, who is a jury, or in our case, us, in understanding the evidence or in determining a fact and issue, a witness qualified as an expert by knowledge, skill, experience, training, or education may testify about it in the form of an opinion or otherwise if, and then it's going to give three factors, and each of the factors has to be present. First factor, if the testimony is based upon sufficient facts or data. Two, the testimony is product of reliable principles and methods. And three, the witness has applied the principles and methods reliably to the facts of the case. Let's see, their motion is saying that Christopher Corbett is not an expert witness, but they're saying that he's not an expert witness based on the slide deck, which is a demonstrative. This says this section will demonstrate that the slide deck is more in the nature of an argumentative summation prepared by the state attorney's office rather than a technical analysis or summary prepared by Sergeant Corbett. This motion demonstrates that Sergeant Corbett should not be admitted as an expert under Florida statute 90.702. And we just saw in 90.702 that if somebody due to their knowledge, their skill, their experience, their training, or their education has specialized knowledge or scientific or techn technical knowledge that can assist a trier of fact in understanding the evidence, then they are able to provide opinions about that evidence if there's enough data or facts to support that opinion, if the, uh, the opinion that they're going to give is the product of reliable principles and methods. So we're not talking like, I don't know, uh, unreliable methods here. These are, these are things that are known uh, in the industry and the industry that Chris Corbett will be talking about will be communications analysis. And three, if Corbett has applied those principles in looking at communications and analyzing communications to the facts of this case. The other statute that they're talking about is 90.956 which is the statute regarding summary evidence. And this section says, when it is not convenient to examine in court the contents of the luminous writings, record, recordings, or photographs, a party may present them in the form of a chart, summary, or calculation by calling a qualified witness. The party intending to use such a summary must give timely written notice of his or her intention to use the summary, proof of which shall be filed with the court and shall make the summary and the originals or duplicates of the data from which the summary is compiled available for examination or copying or both by other parties at a reasonable time and place. A judge may order that they be produced in court. What does this mean? If there's a lot of evidence, if there are thousands of pages of data, it's not necessary to put those thousands of pages of data into evidence. A party may present all that data in a summary format. They can put it in a chart. They can summarize the data. And by summary, it means not everything is going to be specifically stated in the summary. A summary is just that. It's 
it's a, a, a concise condensation of information, right? The party who is going to use such a summary format has to give written notice of their intention to do so, which the state of Florida has done in this case. And the state of Florida has to make both the summary and all the voluminous data, so all the thousands and thousands of pages of raw data or whatever data was used to create the summary, they have to make both things available to the other party, okay? So that the other party can look at the summary and they can look through all the raw data and do whatever they want with it, okay? They can, uh, they can examine it. They can make copies of the summary. They can make copies of the raw data if they choose. Okay, so going back to the motion, section one, Sergeant Corbett's PowerPoint slide deck. This motion first examines the slide deck at issue. In sum, the proposed, in sum, the proposed slide deck is not a fair summary of voluminous records, reduced and made more comprehensible to the jury in a neutral fashion. It is instead something more akin to a mini closing argument. The data inserted and used is designated to look like AT&T records, but it is not a summary. Rather, it is the selective picking and choosing of data in conjunction with interpretations of that data to suit the needs of the state's case. What are they saying? The defense is saying that the summary that the state is proposing to provide and present um, as evidence and provide to the jury is, is bad for them. <laughs> it's only giving them the information that the state wants to provide. It's not neutral. The slide deck spans the entire pool of documentary evidence in this case. Sergeant Corbett was not asked to neutrally summarize the contents of these documents. Instead, he was provided with items for inclusion by the state attorney's office based upon its case strategy. Its compilation further required no scientific, technical, or other specialized knowledge. Footnote two. This is especially the case with regards to the slide deck, slides relevant to Donna Adelson. As we learned in Sergeant Corbett's deposition, the work product involved in those slides, even in slides that are not admissible under the rules of evidence, virtually took no expertise, save time staking word processing abilities. So they're arguing that the slide deck is going to be improper because the witness who is going to present the slide deck, who's going to introduce it into evidence, was not asked to neutrally summarize the contents of the thousands and thousands of pages. I didn't see a requirement for that in the Florida statutes, did you? I also didn't see a requirement that the slide deck requires scientific, technical, or other specialized knowledge. The Florida statute doesn't require the, uh, the testimony to have scientific, technical, or other specialized knowledge. It requires the witness who is testifying, the expert witness who is testifying to have scientific, technical, or other specialized knowledge. Okay, moving on. The state's 90.956 notice, which is the notice, uh, notice that they're going to introduce evidence in a summary fashion, describes the slide, slide deck as a summary of virtually all the documentary evidence in this case. Okay, what's the problem? The slide deck that will be the subject of Sergeant Corbett's testimony was first introduced in discovery through the state's notice of intent to introduce summary pursuant to Florida statute section 90.956, served upon de defense counsel on August 12, 2024. In that notice, the state announced that it, quote, will offer evidence in the form of a summary, close quote. The notice identified the underlying evidence, which is the subject of said notice, as follows. Call detail records for Daniel Markell, Catherine McVanawa, Sigfredo Garcia, Luis Rivera, Charles Adelson, Wendy Adelson, Harvey Adelson, and Donna Adelson. 
Also incorporated into the summary are records from AT&T, Verizon, Sprint, T-Mobile, Spirion GPS, Comfort Rental, Save Gas Rental, Hybrid Rental, Department of Highway Safety and Motor Vehicles, Google Surveillance from Premier Gym, as well as extracts from the above party cell rights, iCloud, and email accounts, among other records provided in discovery. It is not an exaggeration to observe that this puts at issue virtually all documentary evidence that the state has provided in discovery. The notice continues stating that these items, quote, will be presented and relied upon by a qualified witness, Sergeant Chris Corbett of the Tallahassee Police Department, who has previously been listed as an expert in discovery. Footnote three. It should go without saying that Charles Adelson's decision not to oppose Sergeant Corbett's expert designation expert designation during his trial in no way binds Mrs. Adelson here. Back to it, and that a copy of the summary the state intends to use will be provided to opposing counsel by the previously discussed date of September 4th and is listed on state's exhibit list as summary of communication records. Footnote four. After defense counsel objected that it didn't agree to a September 4th exchange deadline, the state produced the slide presentation to the defense on August 19th, 2024. Okay, I don't, this is just factual stuff. I don't see any, um, any legal, any legal noise. As my old torch professor, Eva Hanks would say, make a legal noise. This isn't making any legal noise. This is just, um, this is just stating the facts. B, review of the state's proffered slide deck and Sergeant Corbett's deposition testimony demonstrates that the slide deck is a skewed and selective presentation of the underlying documentary evidence designed to advance and advocate the state's theory of the case rather than an objective summary of voluminous evidence. The state has provided defense counsel a draft that it represents is reflective of the final summary exhibit. Okay, that document is a 329 page PowerPoint slide deck with the Tallahassee Police Department's logo and entitled 2014-019848 Communication Record Analysis. Although the state continues to add slides to the overall deck, the defense feels uncomfortable attaching the presentation in light of the close proximity of trial and will seek the court's guidance on whether it would prefer to review in camera or under seal. In camera means uh, in court chambers, not in public. The presentation also appears to include slides and information violative of the attorney-client privilege, footnote five. If necessary, this issue will be the subject of a separate motion. I'm curious to see what that is. Could it possibly be communications between the Adelsons, Harvey and Ordana, and Rashbaum himself? Interesting. Review of the proposed slide deck reveals that it is far afield from a neutral summary of the records identified in the state's notice. It is instead a curated selection and presentation of excerpts of the underlying documents designed to advance the state's case theory. This was, in fact, attested to by Sergeant Corbett at his deposition. There, Sergeant Corbett testified that the state attorney's office decided what Sergeant Corbett should include. Question. Well, let's start with the entire presentation. How did you go about doing this? Answer. Well, it's a process and it involves generally discussions with this state attorney's office and a decision as to what they would like included in the presentation. We'll discuss, question, okay, answer, discuss information that I have, and then based on the request and knowledge of the case, then I'm asked to put specific things into the presentation. Sergeant Corbett confirmed this every time he was asked explicitly why he included something in the slide deck. For example, when asked about the inclusion of a text message conversation concerning the purchase of a house on slide 25, Sergeant Corbett testified that he does not know where the house referred to is located and that he chose to include these texts because he was asked to do so by the state attorney's office. Question. Okay, why did you include, why did you choose to include this, this slide about the house in your presentation? Answer. 
Again, this is a series of communications that I was asked to include by the state attorney's office as it relates to the relationship between Charlie Adelson, Don Adelson, and Wendy Adelson. Similarly, when asked why he included a particular email at slide 153 of the presentation, Sergeant Corbett testified that he didn't necessarily understand the reasons, but that he was instructed to do so by the state attorney's office question. Was that significant to you in this presentation? What are, what are you trying to present? Answer. Again, the information is reviewed by the state attorney's office and it's the information that they want included. And I may not be privy to all the reasons, but to me, it is the fact that there was a schedule. There was a period of time when, or we would at least should know where the children were going to be at this time frame. The same is true for the calendar entry at slide 154. Question. Okay, okay, all right. If we can go to 154, what is this? Answer. This is a just an extraction from Wendy Adelson Selbright and her timeline events, and it is a calendar entry indicating on July 7 to cancel cable and get Apple TV and Netflix instead. Question. Okay, and why did you include this in your presentation? Answer. Again, it's a piece of information that I was asked to include. Question, do you have any idea of its significance? Answer, I'm not aware of its full significance or again, the overall thought process, but clearly there was information about her television, the repair of the television, and those things that were happening around this time. Phone calls from Stephen Webster on slide 217 were also included at the request of the state attorney's office and not through any exercise of Sergeant Corbett's judgment. Question, why are you now including Mr. Webster's phone calls? What is the significance of that to you? Answer, request from the state attorney's office to include them. And again, as far as the, I think the nature of the proceedings between Mr. Markell and Wendy Adelson around the time of his death. The same is the case for text messages at slides 312 to one, at slides 312 to 135. That doesn't make sense. Okay. Why did you include these text messages? Again, at the request, answer, again, at the request of the state attorney's office. And for a portion of defendant's search history at slide 324, question, why do you include this in there? Again, answer, again, at the request of the state attorney's office. And for text messages at slides 318 to 19, notably, Sergeant Corbett indicates that in response to examination that he does not know whether certain additional documents are, quote, to be, close quote, included in the final version of his presentation. Question, okay, and similar question as to last time, are all these of the WhatsApp messages regarding this issue or are there some that are missing? Answer, there is, this is what I was provided and asked to include. I have looked at this string. I believe there is one additional text message that falls under this. I don't know if it's to be included or not, but there's, I believe on after this, that speaks to the state's star witness being a drug dealer or something. There's one more text message in this conversation. And for text messages at slide 328, question. Okay, fair enough, okay. 328, answer, yes, question. Where did this, where did this come from? Answer, this is also from Donna Adelson's handset, her Cellbrite report. And it is a message apparently sent to herself with the messages you see there as to stop Amazon deliveries, question. And why did you include this? Answer, request of the state attorney's office. Indeed, with respect to all of the defendant's WhatsApp messages, Sergeant Corbett testified that what to include was primarily the state's decision based upon the state's, quote, overall strategy. Question. Okay, and looking at the WhatsApp messages on Donna Adelson's phone, did you find other WhatsApp messages on her phone that you didn't use in this presentation? Answer, yes. Question, okay, and again, how did you decide which ones to use and not use? Answer, that's primarily the determination of the state attorney's office as to what's relevant, admissible, usable, part of their overall strategy. Again, it bears emphasis that these are not isolated examples. Rather, Sergeant Corbett testified that his process for preparing the presentation, quote, involves generally a discussion with the state attorney's office and a decision as to what they would like included in the presentation, close quote, and that, quote, Based on their request and knowledge of the case, then I am asked to put specific things into the presentation, close quote. These examples highlight that in 
every instance in which Sergeant Corbett was asked why he included a particular item in his presentation, he answered that he did so because the state attorney's office asked him to do so. C, the slide deck also purports to summarize inadmissible evidence. In addition to being a work of advocacy, rather than a fair summary of underlying voluminous records, the state slide deck purports to summarize evidence that is itself inadmissible. In its current form, the state's PowerPoint is rife with inadmissible hearsay, for which there is no exception under Florida law, including but not limited to slides 13, 15, 20, 91, 160, 315, 318, and 323. It rests on guesswork disguised as fact, including so-called optimal routes and estimated drive times unsupported by admissible evidence. Slides 250 through 255 and 275 through 281. It references undated visits to web pages that can be seen on Mrs. Adelson's phone, but have no specificity other than that and that are no longer accessible rendering any probative value of this page substantially outweighed by the risk of unfair prejudice, slide 324. It presents speculation, speculative geolocation plotting, examples slide 272 through 279. It features documents, emails, car rental agreements, and receipts that are not in any way voluminous, slides 93, 116, 117, and 244. And in one instance, it includes communications between Mrs. Adelson and Charles Adelson that reflects information protected by the attorney, client, and joint defense privileges. Slides 312 to 316. Okay, so let's go through this first section really quickly. There's a lot here. There's a lot here. So in this first section, it's being argued that the PowerPoint is not neutral. The PowerPoint isn't fair to the defendant because it includes things not great for the defense, um, because it was compiled in a summary format that, um, that was put together by the state attorney's office in conjunction with their expert witness, Chris Corbett. Um, and finally, that it, uh, and finally that it may include uh, evidence that is inadmissible, okay? The first two reasons that I stated, I don't see anything in the uh, in the Florida statutes that prevents the state attorney from contributing to the summary. In fact, it is them who has to create the summary. Let's look at this again, 90.956. When it is not convenient to examine in court, the contents of voluminous writings, record, or photographs, a party may present them in the form of a chart, summary, or calculation by calling a qualified witness. As far as I know, that is what is going, that is exactly what is going to happen by them calling a uh, Chris Corbett, he is a qualified witness based on his knowledge, experience, education, and um, his training. He is an expert in communication analysis. Let me play this for you, which I thought was interesting because there is only a footnote acknowledging that in Charlie's trial, there was absolutely no objection to Chris Corbett being called as an expert witness and to Chris Corbett providing his opinion on the topic. I instruct other law enforcement officers and uh, analysts across the state 
and really across the country in communication record analysis. Um, I believe that's. And what is communication record analysis? Um, communication record analysis is kind of a general term for um, what we can do with the records that are primarily, we're talking about the records that come from communication carriers, like our AT&T, Verizon, cell phone carriers is primarily what we talk about. We also do get records from forensic analysis of phones. We can add that in, but primarily, again, uh, the carrier records and from the various types of reports they're able to give us, we can do analysis such as who a handset, and I say handset for cell phone, communicates with most frequently. Um, again, estimated locations, approximately where was uh, a handset when a certain call was placed. Um, the uh, calling pattern analysis, who calls who, when, all of those kind of things. Really, there's a variety of analysis that we can do with those records kind of uh, pertaining to whatever the investigation uh, needs. And have you ever testified where you've given an opinion in court in the field of historical communication record analysis? I have, yes. About how many times? Uh, 101. Um, Judge, those are all my questions as to his qualifications in that field. If defense has any voir dire. Very well. Mr. Rush? <laughs> no, Your Honor. Is there any objection to the witness providing an opinion in the field of historic communication analysis? No, Your Honor. Members of the jury, the witness will be permitted to provide you with an opinion in this area of historic communication analysis. You may continue. So there you have it. There was absolutely no objection to um, to Chris Corbett being allowed to testify um, with his opinion on these communication analysis issues. Let's keep going through the motion. I want to get to some case law to see if any of the defense propositions are supported, in fact, by any case law. Okay, presenting a slide deck that exhibits documentary evidence curated by the state attorney's office is not expert testimony under Florida statute 90.702. Florida statute 90.702 sets forth the circumstances under which a proffered expert may testify. The witness must be qualified as an expert by knowledge, skill, experience, training, or education. The testimony must involve the application of scientific, technical, or other specialized knowledge in a manner that will assist the trier of fact in understanding the evidence or in determining a fact in issue. And the testimony must meet the following additional con conditions. The testimony is based upon sufficient facts or data. The testimony is the product of reliable principles and methods, and the witness has applied the principles and methods reliably to the facts of the case. That's what we read earlier. Drawing the line between expert and non-expert testimony is important. The courts have a gatekeeping role to ensure that testimony does not result from the application of reliable scientific, technical, or specialized knowledge and methods. Wait, what? The courts have a gatekeeping role to ensure that testimony does not result from the application of reliable scientific, technical, or specialized knowledge and methods, quote, does not reach the jury under the mantle of reliability that accompanies the Appalachian expert testimony. Moving on. The state bears the burden of establishing that its proffered expert, witness, expert testimony falls within Florida Statute 90.702 and that there is therefore entitled to such a mantle of reliability. The Florida Supreme Court has held that law enforcement testimony which merely summarizes and explains data from call detail records, including the mapping of cell phone location data is not expert opinion under Florida statute 90.702 and Daubert because it involves no scientific, technical, or other specialized skill. In King versus State, the Florida Supreme Court observed approvingly its precedent on this score. That's a 2018 case, noting in Gordon versus State, the record demonstrated that a witness, quote, simply factually explained the contents of phone records that linked Gordon to the victim's murder, and the detective factually compared locations on the phone records 
to locations on the cell site maps. This court held that testimony regarding the content of cell phone records and comparing cellular tower site maps to phone records was not expert testimony. Similarly, in McMillian versus State, a 2017 uh, case, the Florida Supreme Court observed, moreover, this court has held that non-experts may testify about phone records. Um, and then it just refers to the case that was just cited in the above case, as well as Perez v. State ruling that cell phone records, cell site maps, and testimony explaining them was properly admitted and did not constitute expert testimony. The Florida Supreme Court is by no means an outlier on this issue. The in United States versus Batista, an 11th Circuit 2014 case, the United States 11th Circuit Court of Appeals affirmed a district court's decision to admit as a lay testimony, an FBI's agent, an FBI agent's use of cell phone records along with phone companies' records of where their cell phone towers were located to plot on a map which towers connected with which cell phone at a particular point in time, even where, quote, in order to produce the maps, the agent had to, one, read the cell phone records to determine which cell tower was used at a particular time, two, look up the latitude and longitude of that cell tower in the company's records, and three, mark the intersection of the latitude and longitude on a map. Uh, they also cite, <clears throat> oh, footnote six, let's see. Footnote six says, of course, the federal court's interpretation of the federal rules of evidence <clears throat> may be relied upon as a persuasive authority when interpreting the corresponding provisions of the Florida Evidence Code. Okay. They're also quite quoting United States versus Feliciano and Williams versus United States. The fact that Sergeant Corbett plans to incorporate in his summary material extracted from Wendy's and Donna's cell phones and Charles iCloud does not alter this conclusion. United States versus Chavez Lopez, concluding that the testimony that recites cell phone extractions, that is hooking the phones up to a computer following a few prompts and saving data onto an external hard drive using Cellbrite, is not expert testimony. Here, Sergeant Corbett's anticipated presentation of the state's PowerPoint slide deck is simply not expert testimony as contemplated by Florida Statute 90.702. The court should therefore not afford in the mantle of credibility that an expert testimony designation entails. Rather, as set forth above, Sergeant Corbett's slide deck merely consists of the presentation of a subset of the documentary evidence in this case, curated and selected by the state attorney's office to advance its theory of the case. In all instances in which Sergeant Corbett was asked at deposition about why he included items in his presentation, he testified that he did so because the state attorney's office wanted to include those items. On several occasions, he testified that he did not know or fully understand why the state wanted it to be included. Regardless, the PowerPoint presentation consists only of a review of cell phone records, extraction data, and other material identified by the state in discovery. Such a presentation does not entail the application of scientific, technical, or other specialized knowledge necessary to yield expert testimony. Okay, so they are really um, downgrading and lessening any type of skill that Chris Corbett brought to um, reviewing this evidence, getting this evidence, reviewing it, compiling it, forming an opinion as to what it means. Um, I haven't looked at any of the cases that are being cited here to see if what the defense says they say is in fact what they say. Um, but they are really downgrading any sort of expertise that Chris Corbett may bring to uh, the review of this evidence and the opinion that he has of this evidence.
One thing that I note, however, about this motion is while he was quick, or while the defense counsel was quick to include excerpts of Chris Corbett's deposition, where he states, you know, he's not sure the reasons why, you know, one document was put in the summary, but not another document was put in the summary. He's not exactly sure of exactly what the documents themselves mean for the case. What was not included in this, is he an expert witness analysis, is any testimony about what he actually did in this case. The cases that the defense cites in the motion, they all are very specific about what the proposed expert, um, what they did in those cases. Uh, here, he simply says, the fact that Sergeant Corbett plans to incorporate in his summary material extracted from, you know, the cell phones and iCloud doesn't alter the conclusion. And Sergeant Corbett's, Sergeant Corbett's anticipated presentation um, those don't tell me what Corbett said in his deposition as to his skills, knowledge, uh, expertise, education that could bolster the claim of him being an expert witness. So instead of listing the 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 activities that uh, Sergeant Corbett, Corbett actually did in this case, which he must have asked him about in the deposition in August, right? Instead of finding those things out specifically, he's simply summarizing and saying, you know, I think Corbett probably only did X, Y, and Z. I think Corbett only uh, extracted the cell phones. I think he only maybe hooked up the phones to a computer and saved the data to an external hard drive. But those are just assumptions. What does Corbett actually testify to his actual actions? Um, and I have a feeling that if Corbett actually, you know, stated the bases of his expertise in his deposition, defense is not going to include that in the motion, right? Now, my question is, <clears throat> and I'm just theorizing here. I'm just, this is kind of stream of consciousness. What if this is granted? What if Judge Everett says, okay, Chris Corbett actually is not an expert witness. If that's the case, then in Charlie Adelson's trial, where Rashbaum did not even voir dire Chris Corbett. He had no objection to Chris Corbett uh, testifying or giving opinion testimony. What does that mean then? Is it possible that we might see in Charlie's appeal ineffective assistance of counsel? Would that have changed anything? What would it change here? What's the state's remedy here if Chris Corbett is not allowed to testify as an expert witness? Then the state just has to put into evidence the voluminous records, right? I can't imagine that happening. I, I cannot imagine that thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of data would have to be entered into evidence and then the state would simply have to piecemeal pick out you know this page and this page and this page and this page individually to ask um to ask chris corbett what this page means what this page means what this page means but not give an opinion as to how it all sort of gels together. Section three, the state's proffered slide deck is not a valid summary admissible under Florida Statute 90.956. Florida Statute 90.956 sets forth the rule applicable to summary exhibits. And I've read the rule already, so I'm not going to repeat it again. So Florida Statute, that section is the Florida law analog of Federal Rule of Evidence 1006. And as Florida courts readily acknowledge the federal court's interpretation of the federal rules of evidence may be relied upon as a persuasive authority when interpreting the corresponding provisions of the Florida Evidence Code. What does this mean? It means he doesn't have any Florida case law. <laughs> he doesn't have any Florida state case law on this topic. So he's going to go to, uh, to some federal uh, case law. 
courts interpreting Rule 1006 observe that it authorizes admission of charts into evidence that serve as a surrogate for the underlying voluminous records that would otherwise be admissible into evidence, thereby reducing the volume of written documents that are introduced into evidence. And that's from a 2019 case. That's a quote from a 2019 case. Stated otherwise, the chart itself is admitted as evidence in order to give the jury evidence of the underlying documents. And therefore, it must be an objectively accurate summarization of the underlying documents, not a skewed selection of some of the documents to further the proponent's theory of the case. Additionally, the rule, con I was just looking at uh, where this case came from. It looks like it came from id. id. It looks like it came from United States versus Janetti, which was a Fourth Circuit case. So I don't know where the Fourth Circuit is, but it's not Florida. It's not Florida. I'm wondering if there is better case law, um, maybe more on point, even if there is Florida state case law or, um, or federal law coming out of Florida or the 11th Circuit that might be more applicable to this, but we'll see. Additionally, the rule contemplates that any summary admitted will have been prepared by a witness available for cross-examination, not by the lawyer trying the case. This is from a Southern District of Florida 2022 case. So that's pretty recent. And that's from Florida. It's a federal, uh, federal case, but it's, it is from Florida. Because summaries are elevated under Rule 1006 and also Florida Statute 90.956 to the position of evidence Care must be taken to omit argumentative matter in the preparation, lest the jury believe that such matter is itself evidence of the assertion it makes. <clears throat> and that is an 11th Circuit quote. Further, like its federal counterpart at Rule 1006, Florida Statute 90.956 should never be used as a, quote, backdoor vehicle for the introduction of evidence which is otherwise inadmissible. If the underlying records are hearsay for which there is no exception, the summary is likewise inadmissible. The same principle would render inadmissible a summary based on documents that are inadmissible for any other reason, such as irrelevancy, unfair prejudice, or lack of authentication, authenticity rather. Uh, see also McCown versus State of Florida 4th DCA case from 2010, in which uh, they found error in admitting summary exhibit based on inadmissible hearsay in the form of unauthenticated bank records. Also a Florida 5th DCA 1991 case reversing an award of damages on grounds that some of the damages reflected on this summary were not proven by competent evidence. Here, the state's PowerPoint slide deck is no mere summary. It does not, by its nature, give the jury an objective account of the underlying documents. Rather, it is precisely the skewed selection of some of the documents to further the proponent's theory of the case against which the Fourth Circuit warned in Olietti. I'm wondering, because they're not specifying anything in particular, which is so skewed that it would further the, the proponent's theory of the case. What specifically, I mean, they're not giving any examples of what is so skewed in their favor. They're, they're, that's what I'm missing in this motion. And, um, I, you know, I, I think that's missing. Maybe it will be addressed tomorrow. 
But just because evidence is in favor of the state, I don't think that that in and of itself should uh, should make the summary inadmissible. This is all the more apparent in light of Sergeant Corbett's straightforward deposition testimony that he selected the material to include in the report, not based upon his efforts to summarize the underlying voluminous documents as Florida Statute 90.956 requires, but because he was asked to put specific things into the presentation as part of the state's overall strategy. So did they ask in the deposition whether Corbett would have put these things into, uh, into a summary if the state had not asked? That's what I want to know. Maybe he doesn't know exactly why. Maybe he would have put it in there. Um, I, that part wasn't in, you know, the, the transcription that was included in this motion. It is also all the more apparent when one examines the proposed exhibit, which includes virtually all of the documentary evidence cherry picked in the case. Again, there's nothing to substantiate, uh, you know, the cherry picking in the case. If it's a summary, you have to include some of the evidence. So perhaps you could create your own summary from the voluminous uh, data that was presented to you that you had an opportunity to go through. Perhaps you make your own summary from that and have Corbett testify um, to things that, you know, are beneficial to the defense. Or perhaps on cross-examination, you ask Corbett about the items that you believe are, you know, very beneficial to the state, ask why he thinks that, you know, what do they mean? The opinion of, uh, of, of what they mean. Either way, if it's gonna be something beneficial to the state, the states could just introduce it individually, right? Finally, the state's PowerPoint appears to include documents and exhibits that are not a portion, that are not a portion of voluminous records in need of summarizing and whose independent admissibility is dubious. For example, okay, here's an example, slides 250 to 55 and 275 to 81 include maps of purported optimal routes and estimated drive times. but no evidentiary foundation for these exhibits has been offered. Slide 324 references un undated records of Google searches and websites that are no longer accessible, for which no evidentiary foundation has been offered and whose admission would run a risk of unfair prejudice that substantially outweighs any probative value it may have. And slides 13, 15, 20, 91, 160, 315, 318, and 323 include documents that contain inadmissible hearsay for which there is no valid exception. So look, I don't believe that evidence otherwise inadmissible should be admitted just by sticking it in a summary, a, a 300 page summary document. Um, and that's what the motion in limine is for, right? Now is the opportunity, now is the chance to go through and pick out each of the pieces of evidence that you believe are not admissible, that are hearsay, that um, can't be authenticated, that, you know, there's no evidentiary foundation that is more prejudicial than probative. Now is when you do that. You don't throw the entire baby away with the bathwater, right? So now is when you go through and say, okay, here's a summary, but slides 13, 15, 20, 91, 160, blah, blah, blah. each of those for these reasons are why those slides should be removed from the summary document.
Conclusion. Through its proffered PowerPoint slide deck, the state seeks to introduce into evidence what essentially amounts to a closing argument. It wishes to walk Sergeant Corbett cloaked in the mantle of credibility that an expert witness designation entails through this slide deck calling the jury's attention to what the slide to what the state views as its most compelling evidence in support of its theory of the case what if it's all compelling evidence what happens then and then the state wishes to submit that slide deck its prepackaged closing argument distillation of what it considers its most important evidence to the jury in the guise of a summary of all the documentary evidence in the case. From a pure trial advocacy standpoint, it's understandable why the state may view this as desirable, but it is neither fair nor permitted by Florida's evidence code. Florida statute 90.702 does not permit a witness who engages merely in parsing cell phone, cell right, or other records to testify as an expert. And Florida statute 90.956 does not permit the state to introduce as a summary exhibit a curated and editorialized selection of only the most favorable portions of the documentary evidence in a case. The court should therefore decline to admit Sergeant Corbett's testimony as 90.702 and, and, and it should exclude the state's proffered PowerPoint slide deck as summary exhibit under 90.956. So they are maintaining that Corbett merely engages in parsing cell phone, cell bright, or other records. <laughs> and those small, little, useless tasks that any old person could do does not make him an expert. I want to go back to Charlie's. Uh, Back to Charlie's trial. And um, and see his wadir so that we can see exactly what he describes as his job, you know, building his expertise, um, to which Daniel Rashbaum did not have a problem with in Charlie Adelson's trial. So let's watch this together. Can you introduce yourself to the jury and spell your name for our court reporter, please? Certainly. Good afternoon. My name is Christopher Corbett, and that's C-O-R-B-I-T-T, -T, and I'm a sergeant with the City of Tallahassee Police Department. And you mentioned you're a sergeant. What unit do you work in at TPD? I currently supervise the Technical Operations Unit, and that's the section of the agency that's responsible for sort of all the high-tech or technological ways that we help out in criminal investigations. That includes things like uh, computer and mobile device forensics, audio and video, um, CCTV retrieval, um, our uh, LPR systems, we have a public safety camera system, all of those. And then what I spend most of my time doing, which is the analysis of communication records or analysis of phone records. And how long have you worked in the Technical Operations Unit at TPD? Uh, well, quite some time. Uh, I believe 2012, 2008 is when I started in there. Okay. And how long have you been uh, the sergeant supervising that unit? 2012. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit about, well, we've heard a little bit about your experience, but your training and experience to be in your position. One moment. One moment. Yes, sir. The bailiff will take you back. We'll have a brief recess for the moment. I think there was an issue here with a, a, a juror or something. I'm not exactly sure. But let me see if I can forward to we get some action. Hundred hours of training specific to uh, communication record analysis. And that again involves the collection of records, retaining the records, the various types of analysis that we do, including location, um, estimating the location of a handset or calling analysis. Um, I instruct other law enforcement officers and uh, analysts across the state and really across the country in communication record analysis. Um, I believe that's... And what is communication record analysis? Um, communication record analysis is kind of a general term for um, what we can do with the records that are primarily, we're talking about the records that come from communication carriers, like our AT&T, Verizon, cell phone carriers is primarily what we talk about. We also do get records from forensic analysis of phones. We can add that in, but primarily, again, uh, the carrier records. And from the various types of reports they're able to give us, we can do analysis such as who a, a handset, I say handset for cell phone, communicates with most frequently. Um, again, estimated locations, approximately where was uh, a handset when a certain call was placed. Um, the uh, calling pattern analysis, who calls who, when, all of those kind of things. Really, there's a variety of analysis that we can do with those records, kind of uh, pertaining to whatever the investigation uh, needs. And have you ever testified where you've given an opinion in court in the field of historical communication record analysis? I have, yes. About how many times? Uh, 101. 
Uh, Judge, those are all my questions as to his qualifications in that field of defense. Has any voir dire? Very well. Mr. Rush? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Is there any objection to the witness providing an opinion in the field of historic communication analysis? No, Your Honor. Members of the jury, the witness will be permitted to provide you with an opinion in this area of historic communication analysis. You may continue. All right. So I wanted to show you that, and then I wanted to show you. 64, 65, 66, and 80. And then finally, this summary that we're going to see where you combined all of that information. Um, did you create uh, a PDF version? Combined summary. And moved into evidence today? Yes. All right. Now, um, do you also have a version via PowerPoint that we can see here in the courtroom altogether? I do, yes. All right, Judge, um, at this time, I would move um, his summary into evidence. This is State's Exhibit 67. There's going to be both a, um, a flash drive containing this and then a physical copy. A PowerPoint no is summary. No, State 67 is admitted. What was that, Dan? Right, no objection. So if you could okay. pull up the summary, the PowerPoint on your end, and we'll get it started. Is. It, it is? is okay. So let me see what I need. Oh, I need, I need, I need. Okay. So again, is this, is this something that Dan Rashbaum should have done in Charlie Adelson's trial? And the fact that it was not done, um, is that any reason to say that, you know, he had ineffective counsel. Good questions. So I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Chris Corbett said he has testi testified 101 times regarding um, communication analysis. I don't see him not testifying in this trial. I don't see Judge Everett not allowing him to testify based on his knowledge, training, and experience. Um, he gave a uh, you know, a pretty thorough list of, you know, the big stuff that he testifies on analysis of phone records, estimated locations of phones, cell pattern analysis, who calls who and when, uh, car looking at carrier records, um, who, what did I write? <laughs> who communicates most frequently and when, you, you know, looking at those call patterns, um, digital forensics. He's been doing this since 2008. And again, he's testified a hundred times, over a hundred times now. So I think the defense will have an uphill battle tomorrow. Um, but we will see. We'll see what happens. I don't think Judge Everett can, you know, nothing's going to go over him. Nothing's going to go over his, over his head. Uh, but Let's see. Let's tune in tomorrow. Uh, I hope you join me here. I will be uh, live streaming the hearing at, I believe it starts at nine o'clock. And we'll see what happens then. All right. I'll talk to you guys later. Until next drop. Peace.